Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of the Bread for Soul Convos with myself, Sir LSG. And uh, this show we've been having different kinds of guests, producers, DJs, singers, club owners and just really um, most players in the, in the music industry to try and share as much knowledge and experiences as possible specifically putting much focus on onto house music because you know that's what we do that's what i believe in and um, on today's show i've been so so blessed to be hosting another legendary figure in my eyes and i'm sure in many people's eyes charisma katronic or people might say justin human how are you <laughs> i'm good man cool right? how yourself I'm good, thank you. I, I can see like um, okay. your your thumb a bit appearing a bit on the in front of the camera. I don't know if you can hold on I the other you. side. All right, cool. Yeah, you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good, bro. I'm good. How you well? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, well, firstly, um, I wanna say thank you, firstly, for joining me. Um, and um, I wanna just get onto your journey, you know, to try and understand a few things about your journey as an artist as a dj as a producer too um the days of of just in human were obviously your hip-hop days you were in a hip-hop group um how old were you then and and was it like how did it happen actually was it from school thing if you could explain the story to us okay so for me this this is what it was um because i didn't really you know have a lot of good clothes and and dress that well, you know, kids would rag on you. And no, um, you know, they, they didn't have any pity. So I figured if I use my talents to get them off my back, you know, then I could probably be all right, you know, just for a minute. Yeah. If they knew that, you know, once I could sing, um, I could dance, and I could DJ. So between those three things, I could, you know, keep their focus on that instead of my clothes. So Justin Human came because, you know, I did a little bit of everything. I danced, I sung, I, you know, I was attempting to make music. I didn't really have a studio back then. And I'm DJ. So I did, you know, basically it all. So that was my name during high school. And I had a little hip hop group. But we, you know, we was just doing, you know, just doing it for the love. And we wasn't trying to get signed or anything. Yeah. So... Uh, I got a little bit older, and I always thought, you know, all right, this name is not going to carry well. <laughs> you know, I came up in the time when it was, you know, icy or hot or, or things like that. That was in the name. So, yeah. you know, I started thinking about, you know, my my personality, and I tend to draw people in, mm. and, you know, from all groups and you know, I never just stuck to one type of uh, person. I, you know, like everybody. Yeah. So I figured, oh, that must be, you know, it must be some type of charisma. And it was close to my government name, so I said, okay, cool. I, 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 I'll, I'll roll with that. And you know, at fifty and sixty, I'll still be one to be called charisma. So yeah, that could work. Yeah, yeah. So that's how the name charisma came about. Right. So you know, all of all of that, you know, uh, led me to wanting to be a DJ and a producer, Mm. you know, because, you know, I was always dancing. And the next thing I think, you know, as a dancer, just like a movie actor, you know, they want to be, you know, a producer or a director. Mm. So, you know, I'm dancing to these, you know, to this music, but I want to make some of this music that, you know, that people are dancing to. I'm a dancer. I, I know what they like. I, I got a good sense of music, so you know, let me try a thing. And you know, I started my my uh, my production career at seventeen as well. Yeah, and um, I, I do have to ask you though. Then, uh, oh, before we continue, I wanted to ask you if you could kind of tilt your phone towards you because there's a lot of headroom. I know you can't see yourself. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, much better, much better. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, mm-hmm. So once you then got into the music thing and and you really were the the really early days you know like when you want to start creating music uh, like if it's at 17 i want to understand um who were you listening to back then at that time was it always because i want to talk to you about 
the duality of hip hop and house that you have, which we'll we'll talk a bit more about later. But who, which, which were the, some of the artists that you were listening to at that time? Um, wow, a lot of uh, everybody. Like um, I came up in a time where you could hear like talking heads next to uh, Africa Bombada and you know uh, a lot of different genres of music. And I'll say this for Baltimore, we got a, a, a healthy dose of everything. So um, I was listening to, you know, Mr. Magic back in the day, um, Marley Mall, all of these guys, and, you know, Tony Humphreys, obviously, and, you know, Louis Vega, and, and uh, uh, you know, anybody who was anybody that I can get my hands on, you know, tape wise. Mm -hmm or music wise, I was I was trying to listen to, you know. And, you know, like I said, because Baltimore got a lot of different genres of music, you know, we tend to listen to it all. It was just, you know, there wasn't one phase for just one type of music. We listened to it all. Yeah. So, you know, that, you know, that and, you know, coming and, and I'm sorry, being that, you know, I'm a kid of the 70s, that also means I was there for the birth of hip hop. Even though I wasn't from New York, you know, we got that as well. Mm. And I was in love with it. And I, you know, it was something new, um, people expressing how they feel, you know, no cut cards. So, you know, I fell in love with it. And, you know, a little bit after then, you know, house music, you know, started to be played on the radio. And, you know, I pretty much think like everybody else, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the first, you know, is uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Fingers, Can You Feel It? Yeah. When I heard that, man, and then, you know, to add, you know, more hype to it, they used to play the mix with Martin Luther King on it. So, woo, wow, yeah. that was, you know, my head was blown. Yeah. And, you know, that music was beautiful. And I had to know what this was. And then, you know, then came the acid thing. And I was into all of that, you know, with Mike Dunn and you know, all the Chicago cats. Wow. So I was hooked immediately. And those two uh, genres of music, you know, in between, you know, anything else that came out during that time, I was into, but those two stuck. You know, I played a little bit of reggae and, you know, in my DJ career, I've also played uh, drum and bass and then, you know, intelligent stuff. Yeah. But, you know, house and hip hop has always been the mainstay. Yeah. And, you know, I started to fall out of love with hip hop in the sense of where I was going, you know, um, morally. And, you know, I don't really put moral on, you know, too many genres of music, but it was just going the way that I, I couldn't play. It. Mm. I wasn't feeling it. So, you know, house became really it for me. You know, yeah. I still dabble in, in hip hop and, you know, I still listen to what's coming out. But, you know, house is it for me for, for the moment. Yeah. And I just want to mm -hmm. get like this kind of view from you with regards to um, the movement of hip hop towards um, what you would say it wasn't so morally comfortable if i may put it that way like for you i feel the same mm -hmm. you know like um for a lot of other genres and um if especially the lyrical content and um what is being sold uh, but i want the question i want to get to is really about um what do you think in your view is are some of the reasons these shifts happen where you could have house music as or, or hip hop even as this underground authentic uh, thing, authentic, authentic sound, and you know lyrics that are really uplifting, that are motivating, that are not really putting down anyone, and to at at that point to have that kind of sound as the mainstream sound, and you seeing the change that would happen, you know, seeing lesser of that and more of kind of you know, the more degrading um, kind of hip hop, if I'm put for lack of a better word. What are some of the reasons mm -hmm. you think those kind of shifts happen within the music industry, especially the mainstream? I will give you one motivator for a lot of bad stuff. Money. 
money. Mm. Uh, you know, it's been said, uh, you know, uh, even uh, Cardi B recently said she tried to make, you know, a positive record and it didn't sell. And, you know, to me, that's a cop out. Because you're doing a disservice to your fans, man. You know, put out, put out whatever you're putting out, but put some, you know, good energy out there, too. Mm. You know, actually, I think you should be putting more good energy out there right now because we need it. Mm. You know, we're all in the spot right now. So, you know, good energy, you know, and, and to me, still, that's not something that's being really circulated in, in the hip hop genre, you know. Mm. And that's one thing about House too that drew me. Um, the the fact that you know it's like a family, and I think hip hop started out that way, but now it's all you know. I gotta get mine, you gotta get yours. Not the attitude to have, man. So you know the the answer to that music. There's no reasons. It's a reason. Money. Yeah. yeah. That's why things change. If you can make money if Trial Call Quest could, could be a number one seller, then they would all be making that type music. Mm. You know, if uh, you know, if a lot of people were making, you know, positive music and it hit number one and they they were getting paid a lot of money for it, that's what we would be getting. Mm. So that's that's what it is, man. Straight and simple. Yeah. Money, unfortunately. And w- would you say to a certain extent house music or um rather dance music in general has became like that too oh yeah any any genre of music that makes people spend money that's what's going to happen you know the, the underground thing you know people always say you know it's, it's best in the underground and it's best kept in the underground and it's true it, it really is true but Unfortunately, for things to blossom, some things got to become commercial so people can hear, so other people can be exposed. But at that exposure, what happens is you can, you know, you can hire people who can try to mimic what we do. And it's some watered down, you know, acceptable version of what we do that they'll label as, you know, deep house or some genre that they just caught on to that we already knew about, you know? And even within that, the different genres of house music, that never used to exist. Mm-hmm. It was just house music, mm-hmm. just like hip hop. You know, it was, now we got so many sub genres of it, it's confusing people. And it's just, it's just hip hop, man. Mm-hmm. It's just house. You can call it deep house, you can call it, you know, but it's house. Mm-hmm. That's it, man. man. Stop trying to divide us. Yeah, but I I think uh, also like the house music culture, like we kind of have allowed the the divisions to happen, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Especially with ten, in in terms of genres, like um, mm-hmm. you know, all of our stores do it, and maybe it could be like okay, if I wanna find a certain sound, I, I'll search here. It makes it easier, but with that also comes the real actual divisions you know like whether it's in a club scene and you're seeing different scenes um i'll explain to you as well like in south africa the kind of how as much as house music is so big there's a lot of um different scenes of house music um all still underground you know um and to a certain extent some of those get to live in the same space um uh, simultaneously but most of the time you know you you know that there will be a deep house party there'd be like a, a mainstream house afro house party if i may put it like that not necessarily being called that but there is that thing in south africa too but i want to just get back to your point about money and ask you about um success especially um financial success does it ever get to a point or within your career while you're doing the music that you love and and you are being as authentic as you can does it ever get to a point where you feel like you you could be getting more or you could be getting more if you are doing something else if you're doing a certain sound and the reason i'm asking this is that money also can be a motivator for people you know or a demotivator that when people see us 
doing this kind of music they don't see the dilemma mm-hmm. they don't see the lights they don't see the expensive cars you know um has that mm-hmm. ever been a thing for you did it ever get to you um okay i am 50 years old so yes you know I've, I've you know been depressed behind this because i really care about it and you know things can get to you there was a point where i you know I wanted to stop doing music because I thought I, you know, I wasn't, you know, relevant and I'm seeing, you know, the younger generation come in. So I'm thinking, wow, you know, like you, you, you get fooled. That's, that's what I'll say. Um, you know, you, you sign into these social things like SoundCloud and, and uh, Instagram, and then you, you're being put into a competitor mode. You know, you know, this person got 20,000 people liking them, you know, and you start to feel like, wow, I only got a thousand, I only got 50 likes a day. You start to feel inadequate. But, you know, I am, I'm a big fan of uh, documentaries. And I remember Bootsy Collins said, you always have to come back to your one. And my one is this music, man. Like, I can cook, I can do other things, but my one is this music. And if I felt like if I stopped doing music, then I lower the bar. If uh, people we like say at jazz and, and Ocean La Day or you know, Louis Vega, if they stop doing music, that lowers the bar, what comes in and what gets respected as the, you know, the house sound or the sound. So, you know, any of us, you know, we've all had that moment of, man, if I just, you know, made some techno or if I just, you know, added some trance strings to my thing or or if I just did this, you know, I could be on top. And yeah, you could do that. But the reality of it is for a lot of us, we just don't have it in us, you know, to do that. Because people who do that, just do that. You know, they... it's. It's not a thing they have to think of. It it comes out of them commercial, yeah. and you know it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Us, you know, the moment I start to hear anything, a hi hat that sounds too, or them keys sound a little, mm, I'm pulling it out, <laughs> you know, because yeah. that's not where I want to go. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I think we all think that, but if we truly being honest with ourselves, you know. That's not, we couldn't do that because we haven't, you know? So why go there? So my thing is, you know, I've not been overly successful, but I love it, man. And, you know, it's nothing I'd rather do. And I like what I put out and I'm proud of what I put out. And I stand behind it. There's not a moment where, I, you know, I've made a record and been like, ooh, I shouldn't have did that. Or a remix where, you know, I remix something and it's like, well, why did I remix that? No, you know, every time I do music and if I do remixes for people, you know, it's a gift because I know that they're handing their baby over to me. Mm-hmm. So I need to, you know, return it back, you know, with some rims, you know, or, you know, with a nice little shine on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's the way I feel about music. Man. It's, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's more than what people give it credit for. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's a motivator and it's a uniter. And, you know, that's why, you know, it's kind of piggying back, but, you know, to our, our, our first of the conversation, you know, money can't be the motivator of this thing. I understand it, mm-hmm. but it can't be because look at what we have now. It's, it's, it's a lot of bad stuff, bad energy floating out there. And, you know, this is not the time for it. We need that higher, we need that, that high energy, man. Mm-hmm. You know? Man, and, but, and, and I get you so much. Sorry to cut you off. But, you know, that, that's that. And I'm not going to go there. I'm going to get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but I also wanted to say that I feel like um, what you mentioned with regards to social media, what, what that has also done is that it has put people in a way that um it's almost like the mu- 
to, to putting out the music you're putting out to be judged you know like you're kind of putting out to oh, be yeah. to be compared to the next thing and also it's it's kind of like a space of high competition you know it just feels um i don't know it doesn't feel right to me when if if i release something and now I, but i'm paying more focus at who's listening to the next dj you know like how look how many people how many people are buying this album or whatever the case may be you know and i think it has caused people to stop making music for the sake of making music it's kind of like like you, the thing that you said think about it first you know it's in the mind first before the actual music even happens and uh, mm-hmm. in that sense we've lost um we probably lose out on a lot of authenticity and and real stories within the music and, and you know the kind of love and uplifting vibes you know with the music um but i want to get back yeah like to the to the nicer stuff <laughs> as well um okay, okay. you know you you mentioned larry head and you know when i was checking up you and he's been especially earlier in the day an influencer you know one of the biggest influencers for you but also for many other people I, I want to know if you could describe at the times, you know, like the times of Larry Head, Ten City as well, um, where house music was really, really booming in the States. Um, how would you describe the nightlife, nightlife culture? Um, well, it was, it was really vibrant. Man. We had like quite a few clubs here in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, when Ten City stuff, when Larry Heard stuff was being played, you know, it was, you know, it, the bad, the thing here was battling to see who could get the newest first. You know, that was the thing. Who had the new this or who had the new, you know, uh, uh, asset record or who had that new warehouse record. But it, that's, that was the thing here. Who had the, the craziest sounding thing? And, you know, for us as patrons, that made it better because it was like we was getting, we was getting it, man. We was getting all the, you know, all the hot stuff. Like, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite sure that went on there as well. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, that's 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 where it was. It, it was really vibrant, and you know, it was always, you know, good as a DJ for me, because uh, what I would do was after the club would close. I would go to breakfast if I didn't have to go to work and go straight to the record store to <laughs> to buy what I heard or saw was peeping over the the uh, the DJ desk to see. Yeah. And w- w- I'm gonna tell you how how bad the game was here. Some of the DJs would do stuff like put you know how sometimes on a piece of vinyl you get like a couple labels extra. Yeah. Yeah. They would put the extra labels over, so you'd be looking at the record, and that wouldn't even be the label. Yeah. So they would fool you that way, or they would totally black out that record, man. <laughs> so yeah, if that can tell you how the nightlife is, that that that's just a peek in. That's how serious it was for us. Yeah. You know. So yeah, man. Yeah. Very uh, vibrant here, man. Yeah. I mean, b- before you carry on, because you mentioned work, I thought I should ask you about that. Like, what were you doing when you were working? What are some of the jobs that you've done? Back in your days? Uh, uh, let's see. I was a counselor for Goodwill. Uh, I worked at uh, McDonald's. And in Baltimore, we used to have a, a chain called Chicken George. Uh, so I worked there. And then lastly, I worked at Johns Hopkins as a chef. And that's what I pretty much did up until the time I joined Basement Boys. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep, straight straight from Johns Hopkins to Basement Boys. After uh, Spin and I did the beautiful remix, it was like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. You know, I, I loved it. I did it for quite a bit, but I was also at the point where I, I wanted to change too. And it, you know, I took a step out on you know on faith that joining Basement Boys would be a good thing for me because it could have it could have went so wrong. It could have went so wrong, <laughs> but it didn't, man. It was the best thing I could have did, you know, because yeah. I learned so much from those guys, you know. I, I didn't know anything. You know, I was just still, you know, trying to think, just trying to, to be the best or, or, you know, 
that I could be at that point. But they taught me sound structure, you know, engineering, and, you know, patience. That's another thing. Because I used to sit in with, like, uh, engineers and, you know, all night sometimes and, and just watch them. And, you know, it takes time for that record to sound good. You know, when you're working, well, back then, on the board, and even now on the laptop, if you really care about it, it takes time for you to get it to where it needs to be. So, you know, if, if, if anything, you know, that whole experience of being a bass of boys taught me a lot. But yeah. patience was the, the, the best lesson. Yeah. And, and how important just like being, um, having mentors like that, you know, because um, my career as well, like uh, I've been, you know, I met Ralph Gam in 2011. I started producing 2008, yeah, 2010. Eight, yeah, correct. So, mm -hmm. but I, but I met Ralph in in 2011, you know, and meeting him really changed so much about my sound, you know, like it just enhanced uh, the way I was listening, the way I was approaching my music, you know, as well. So I find that like having you know that kind of a mentor really had a, a big impact on on my life. But um, I want to know from you, just like being part of the Basement Boys, especially probably you were. Yeah, a bit younger than the guys. How was the experience mm -hmm. for you, and how important did that mentorship be become? I I I, I was I explain it like this. Okay, DJ Spin. Uh, I used to listen to this guy on the radio, and for years, like he lived um, across town, but. You know, he was on the radio. I was doing what I was doing at the same time, but not nearly getting any, you know, recognition, which was good because I was grinding. That's what needed to happen. But I idolized that guy. Same with Teddy Douglas. Like, that guy used to kill, man. Like, there's been many a nights both of those guys have sent me home and, like, I had cramps, body cramps from dancing all night long or been super inspired to, you know, to make something. So actually getting, you know, into a group with these guys and seeing them at them every day and, you know, what me and Spin have and that becoming like a kinship and, you know, brotherhood. I mean, like, you know, that's, that's like how you were saying with you and Ralph Gump. You couldn't dream of it happening and then you know for it to actually work out yeah. that's another thing because you can meet your idols and stuff and it it cannot <laughs> it cannot end well yeah. so for this to actually work out and for this thing to still be a thing you know where we still go on the road together and we still have a kinship you know you can't pay for that mm -hmm. so you know it was it was a beautiful thing man i, I loved every minute of it man yeah and um, mm -hmm. man, and it's such an, an, an understated thing, um, the whole mentorship thing. But like you say, it, it doesn't always work mm -hmm. out because I, I wasn't the first person um, Ralph had met or released from South Africa. You know, there were some other guys before me and different factors, whether you're vibing with the person, if the relationship works, you know, if you understand one another. It's kind of like meeting mm -hmm. and working with musicians, you know. You, you could have mm -hmm. the best musicians in, in one room and so, and nothing works out, you know. It does happen mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I want to get into, just to, to understand, when did you, uh, it's quite ironic because I'm going to mention money again, but when did you realize that this could be a career that could, possibly sustain you, you know, because it's one thing to have the passion, but actually to see it, okay, I'm getting a few gigs here, I'm getting some work done here, I'm enjoying myself. When did that happen for you to where you could see actually this could be a career that sustains you for your life? Um, when we did a remix for, um, actually it was our second remix, for Atlantic, uh, True Solace, thank you, right? That's our second remix of Spin and Charisma. And that was Major Label, and the check came. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get a couple more of these, yeah. I think I can do this, yeah, you know? Yeah, Because, you know, you know, if you really go, if you can stack it, I, I can make it. So, yeah, that's, that's when I realized, oh, yeah, that's something to this. And that wasn't even a DJing aspect of it. That was just, you know, 
one remix. So, you know, if we do some more, then that means yeah. ching, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was it. That was the moment we got the check for a major label remix, yeah. you know. That was that. And, and mind you, that wasn't, this was in the decline of it. So it wasn't like it was stupid money, mm. but it was money that I could live off of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, man. I was like, yeah, okay. All we got to we, word, this is how okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Can do this. Yeah. Can do this. Yep. Man. And uh, I was talking to um DJ Spinner um back, you know on the show as well and I asked him a similar question of you know when he was doing remixes for for major label, labels, um, Louis too, you know, as, as masters at work, I mean, they were really in it uh, mm -hmm. back in the days, you know, when, mm -hmm. when, when major labels were really, really into house music. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I want to understand that, like, what, what do you think is the change, though, like, with regards to major labels support, being supportive of house, house music? Or is it just still about money? Would you say that? Still. Yeah. That's why, that's why, once it stop making money, uh, well, a lot of money, because it still makes money. Um, um, because, you know, you start to know people in the inside of the business. When you start seeing A&Rs and then dance departments, like none of these labels have dance departments now. They'll just sign a record if it's hot now. That's it. There's no department for that. So once that started happening, it was like, ooh, Okay. Mm. And, you know, it started disappearing from radio as well. Mm. So, once again, it, you know, the waters are starting to draw in and starting to get dry. And that's when they abandon it. You know, not thinking, oh, you know, it could come back around or let's, you know, let's, there's still some things happening here. Mm. But, you know, they cashed out, basically. Mm. Which, I think, too, you know, there's a benefit to us, you know. It, it, it was a benefit to us because, you know, thank you. Let us have it back. That's that's the way I feel about it. Mm, you yeah. know, thank you. We can we can you know, we can do our own dance departments. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it would be nice to be signed to a major label and, or whatever the case may be. You can license me, mm. but I got this from now on. You know, it, it, it gave us the power back. Mm, mm. That's all. Yeah. And um, I want to talk you about talk to you about the scene, though, like the scene in the states especially for house music not necessarily looking about looking at radio or major labels but just the underground scene itself and the nightclubs um is it because once that popularity was kind of declining that people kind of stopped being into the music like general public yeah, and nightclubs closing down what are some of those reasons too you know because i'm very interested because I i'm asking this from a point of not really fear but like concern for our scene in south africa too because i believe that we've got a healthy scene you know we've got a lot of people into the music a lot of young people too you know you get 18 year old 16 year old boys still really really into house music and that's a dope thing to to have for for the longevity of of the music itself but for the underground scene in the states what are some of those reasons then that the underground itself could not sustain itself um, in a way that it was back in the days? A uh, plethora of things. Uh, they started closing down clubs, being real strict on nightlife. So that's one outlet, you know, gone. Uh, they're not playing it on the radio as much, outlet gone. And then, you know, there was this stigma as well with house. And, you know, when, when I came into it, like you could actually play hip hop and house in the same setting, right? And then all of a sudden it became, oh well, house music is gay music. Okay. All music is gay music then. You know what I mean? That's the way I thought about it. But okay, you can go ahead with that. Um so yeah, then they tried to put that stigma on it and then there became a division of hip hop and house. And then that's, you know, I, I think that's where it started to fall off between those three things. And like I said, if you don't have any outlets, radio, the clubs, the dance to this music too, it's going to fall off, mm. you know. 
And it's only going to be certain people that, you know, the underground that sustains it. And, you know, it's not that we haven't, but it's been a battle, you know, and it's still a battle. I don't even think there is an underground now because, you know, the other thing that, that has changed, too, is the fact that, you know, anybody, and I'm saying this very lightly, can be a DJ or a producer, you know. And, and that's another thing, you know, getting back to, I hate to keep going back to your questions, but, you know, things that make you not want to do music. You know, that critique of, you know, you used to be a dancer and you used to be my best friend or you used to be that on the dance floor. And now you get to critique what I do. But, you know, they get to. Or, or they feel they have the right to, and fair enough, they do. But you know that that just you know that 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 that, that makes it harder, you know. And and it they don't understand. It also makes it harder for us as an artist because now we gotta fight through all you guys to get our music through, yeah. you know. And you know it's fair enough, but you know I think honestly. 70% of these new ones is, is not what we need to hear. 30% actually got something we need to hear. And, and that's my whole point. Mm. In life, in music, if you don't have anything different or new to say, then we don't need you in the conversation. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I feel you, man. I feel you so much. Because mm -hmm. also, it has gotten to a point where the ones that have been doing it for a long time, it's almost like you can't even critique um, mm -hmm. a, a poorly mixed, uh, produced song, whatever the case may be, because there's so many of them, and it's almost like mm -hmm. anybody can do anything that they want. There's so mm -hmm. much influx, you know, like, um, mm -hmm. I don't know how many songs are released every day, you know, uh, daily. And there's, I mean, like, I don't want to be the one to say people should not do whatever they want to do. Cool, but no, also... No, I, I, we, we, uh, you know, I don't think it's that, you know. I want you to do it. But I also think, you know, all right, Snoop Dogg said this. He said, you know, as far as hip hop, and I think it's true for any genre of music right now, or, you know, uh, what happened is the fans became producers and DJs. And this is what we have, you know. And not that, you know, we don't want you to be creative, but we don't need to all hear it you know that's for you at home you know and, and you know the the wanting of the five minutes of fame is a bit much man like mm. no if you don't have anything new or different to say then you're wasting our time man and time is precious mm. and i'm glad that you know you get to have fun and you know you're being creative but you know you got to realize you're also part of the problem you know. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think those that are really um, good, you know, those who are passionate, like really you can hear passion. It comes through like mm -hmm. it, it's not something that you can you, you could even miss. Like those who are really good at what they do and those who spend time becoming better at what they do, like it, it's audible in the sound and, and you can hear it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time the results are there, too. You know, like why is so and so not working with me i mean like you know listen mm -hmm. to your sound right you know um anyway mm -hmm. i, I, I want to ask in 1999 you released um the power and you know the the power ep but like the song itself was a smashing tune and was licensed in south africa by vinnie da vinci on his um mm -hmm. deep house sounds compilation um, mm -hmm. At the time, did you get some idea of the emergence of house music in South Africa? No, I did not know anything was going on, honestly, until the Ben West Beach thing and Chardet. That's what when I heard, you know, and then, uh, you know, little rumblings of the power. But more so, the Ben West speech and, and the Sade is when I, you know, I people in South Africa playing music. They're like, no, no way, really? The Ben West speech thing? Okay, you know, that's I, I, you know, I like it. That's one of my favorites. But really, 
Okay. So randomly shot, dude. Like I'm never one of those guys that make music and think, oh yeah, it, you know, it's gonna kill people. Yeah. It kills me, and I hope it kills everybody else. Yeah. There's always hope for me. There's never, oh, I rocked it. Yeah. It's, I think I rocked it. You know, I really like this, and here you go. That's always me for music, man. Yeah. So that's what it was, man. I was like, I was generally shocked that you guys were into my music. Ah, like the the Ben was beach thing. Ew, oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. I should I should actually take out the vinyl just to show you. Um, bro, that tune I think, and for such a you know dark, if I may put it that way, for such a soft song, it's such a powerful song too. You know, like it, it, man, I remember it was two thousand and seven. I was in my second year of DJing. I, I was doing also second year at, at university. And probably the reason why I, I failed, you know, but house music really, especially that era of 2005, 2009, in South Africa, we really received, you know, li- a lot of licensings, you know, from abroad, from Europe, from the States, but really, really dope records, you know, and, and the hangaround mm-hmm. was, yeah, one of those. Also, the second one, take this out, you know, the, the original. Yes. Bruh. Also another not so like um, loud song, but like really, really deep, you know, and people really are into that, that kind of sound. And sometimes it's not necessarily the sound, it's the song itself, it's the way it comes out, you know, that people relate to it so mm-hmm. much. Um, so how have you ever then um, get, gotten a lot of requests for, for South Africa, uh, especially after the release of those songs? Yeah, definitely. Because I think after after those things were out, I did the first uh, South African, well, not the first one, maybe the second or third one, uh, South African Musical uh, Festival with, with Ralph and, and I think Paul Fee was there as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so that's what started to happen. And I started to come there a bit. Yeah. And I did a did a tour with, with Vinny, and uh and chris and, and all of those guys man and yeah yeah y'all y'all got it <laughs> y'all got it man yeah because it was like when i came back home i was like y'all won't believe like these guys actually like listen to house music like we you like not me but how the public would listen to house music when it was on the radio you would hear it in people's cars going down the street like that was utterly amazing to to you know to me because you know we're from the home of it and we don't have anything like that now very rarely you know do i hear somebody coming down the street playing house yeah bro and so yeah that blew my mind man yeah but like also um we haven't seen you doing a lot of tours you know like it's just like back in those days and i remember you did one with spain um um i think you were, you were booked by hk um in mafikeng it was in the more and them kind of like an open area kind of a, a semi-rural town if i may put it that way um mm-hmm. i don't know if you remember that th- those vibes so as you were coming like the last time you came to south africa compared to um, when you initially like were coming those first two or three gigs, um, would you mm-hmm. have would you say there were there was much comparison or much differences? The only thing I would say that I noticed was I heard I heard some hip hop music, and I thought I would never hear that there. It was like some trap something. And I heard two or three people playing something. I was like, word? Okay, so, oh, God. That's all I thought. Oh, God. Uh, it's just like, this, you know, it's coming like the States now. But, you know, y'all holding it down. So uh, I'm just praying for y'all at this point. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think that... Um... I, mean, because, I mean, I get it. It's young people music, so I get it, man. But, you know, uh, from from what I'd known of South Africa... I'm just hoping, you know, y'all, you know, I hope you guys maintain. That's all. Yeah, know? yeah. That's all. 
Yeah, I think the underground, you know, itself has been self-maintaining for for such a long time in South Africa. Yes, mm-hmm. there was a time where um, we had a lot of airplay, you know, from you know radio playing underground jams, uh, you know, a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, we had mm-hmm. Ralph in 2013 had one of the biggest records with Monique Bingham, and he's always had big records with Monique, but. Radio would re- would really really play those kind of songs, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. it's still there. It, it's not as big as it used to be, you know. And the thing about South Africa as well is that um, there could be um, in the townships uh, there could be a certain sound that comes in every every now and then. There was a time when hip hop in South Africa was really the mainstream thing you know like um you would mm-hmm. have initially you would have maybe one hip-hop dj in a party but it got to a point where you had one house guy and a lot of hip-hop you know and then it changed back mm-hmm. again to to having more house music more dance music as also another thing is that there would be um kind of um other sub genres of house but really locally created you know there's a sound called gom I don't know if you've heard of it. it it's kind of like mm-hmm. high energy drum sound, drum tracks really, not, not really musical in terms of chords, in terms of um, the production, but really just high energy sound. Mm-hmm. And But not like close to EDM either, but it was a local sound and they fused that with local um, languages, you know, you could say Zulu or of course, uh, Soto, any any kind of local language, but there was the, that kind of sound. Recently, there's another one that really blew up in, in the past two, three years called Ama Piano. You know, if you come... I've to, heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and in the township, it's kind of like, it's a movement. And once people get into a certain movement and the townships are really pushing that, it, it slowly mm-hmm. gets to the mainstream, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And the only issue with mainstream media in South Africa that I have is that when something like that happens, when a new sound comes through and mm-hmm. they are kind of being forced to play the sound, it's almost like they, they stop playing everything else, you know, and, and they mm-hmm. focus only on mm-hmm. one sound. And then you'd mm-hmm. see the underground kind of ha- house music p- being played less and less, but it's coming back again. But one thing mm-hmm. that we've always had though, that has been consistent and if not has been, kind of on always growing is the underground scene you know the nightclubs the events that guys put up djs you know becoming promoters and that has really been growing in in sa i want to know have you have you been recently um in in recent years getting any requests from local uh, promoters in south africa uh not yet not yet yeah but you know like it's one of those things that too i got work to do I, 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 I feel like I need to make some more gems. So it's one of the, like, if I don't get invited places, I don't take it no way. I just think, hey, okay. So I need to, you know, I need to grind and do what I do. So eventually there'll be, you know, I'll have something out there. And if they like it, then, you know, they'll book me, you know, and, and it'll come. I never worry about, oh, they're not booking me. Because that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna worry about that. I, I feel like whenever it's time, I'll I'll be there. You know, yeah. I, I'm I'll be there when I'm supposed to be there. I yeah. never stress it, man. Yeah, yeah, man. I can't wait for that because um, also what I've seen some videos um when you play, especially with Spen too. I don't know what you guys do with the CDJ, man. Like what a, what the hell? You know, like the kind of mix the technique that you have. What do you do actually? I need. I have to know because, like, for me, when I look at it, it looks mm-hmm. like it's a, a kind of um, a mixture of hip hop break beats and house music. But the energy as well is there. Mm-hmm. How would you describe your style, your DJing style specifically? Well, I, okay, for me, this is what it was, right? I, I believe um, you should master, you know, all the equipment you have. You know, and back in the day, I only could afford like uh, the Pioneer system that that had the two CDs, CDs, and you had the draw system, right? So 
they had a looping function on it. And I was like, okay, if I'm paying all this money for this thing, I am going to use these hot cues. I'm going to use everything on it like an instrument. I really started looking at it as an instrument. And for about a year, I practiced, you know, hot cueing and saving hot cues and, you know, listening to records and figuring out where I could, you know, put in points that I wanted to, you know, add what I call add drama to. So, you know, after a year about doing that, I started going on a road with it and, you know, people was just like, what are you doing? And the same thing I'm explaining to you. I'm looking at this thing not as just music, you know, just as a music player. I see options, you know. There's a way I can make this more dramatic or there's a way I can make something happen here that wouldn't normally happen, you know, like like a turntable is because of the hip hop roots in it, you know. And, you know, that's, that's where I was with it. Is the only thing I'm doing is just try to be creative in a moment. Like, it's never uh, one of those things where I practice it to the point where it's just a routine every time because I think that's why. Yeah. I think whenever I do something, whether it's on point or not, it's all spontaneous and it's organic. So that's more fun. You know, for, you know, I, I think for people who come to hear me play, you never know what I'm going to do. And I like to, you know, I like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I always want to have you going, but well, what just happened? Yeah. Or what mix is this? Mm-hmm. That's my, you know, that's my, my, my ish. That's, yeah. that's what I like to do. You know, I, I, I'm not a hands in the air kind of dude. I'm a, I want your face to, to make an ugly face. What is he playing? Oh my Oh, that's me, you know, and that's my mode. So that that falls into the whole, you know, um, CDJ thing. Like, I want to have those moments with with you that, you know, maybe you'll talk about, but more more importantly, you're listening to and you want to go, oh, how did he do that? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's what made me get into, you know, other DJs and turntablism and hip hop is how did they do that? and sampling, you know, Pete Rock and Dilla, how did they do that? That's the question I want to answer, you know, like, and I want people to feel the same way with me. How did he do that? You know, how did he mix, what was he, you know, I I like those questions, you know, with, you know, when it comes to my music, I want you to question. Yeah, bro, yeah, man, I I hear you loud and clear, and I really can't wait to see you back here in SA, Um, you know, I don't know when, when the time is right, I, I really yes, do wanna yes. want people to check that out, and also, hopefully for a bit longer than you guys normally come. You know, like um, if you come in for one or two gigs, it's dope. Uh, sometimes it's the timing thing, sometimes it's the money, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I think for people to really experience uh, when you come in from outside as a as a as a producer, um, for you to mm-hmm. really experience fully how the scene is i feel you need to spend a bit more time and travel to other cities you know the the, mm-hmm. the smaller towns especially you know like I, I feel like there's a lot of love in in the inland areas other coastal areas like durban too you know um they've got mm-hmm. when a party is good when you've got a good lineup the house heads mm-hmm. do come out and, and really it, it, it becomes a, a dope thing um mm-hmm. Just while talking about cities, I've traveled only twice um, outside the continent and, and I went to Berlin in 2017 and mm-hmm. last year I went to Toronto um, with Ralph and mm-hmm. just I, I'm interested to hear your view with regards to the sounds and feel of different cities because when I played in both those cities, it, it did feel quite foreign, you know, compared to mm-hmm. how I would normally play in South Africa. Just the energy, you mm-hmm. know, and not being, not having, having not done that more or enough, it kind of, the the, the inexperience um, comes through. Mm-hmm. Like, I can just tell myself, I'm not sure about the people, but like, I can feel that, man, it feels a bit uncomfortable. How would you describe mm-hmm. sounds of different cities? Maybe if you could say, pick up, two or three cities that you regularly play at and the difference in, in their sounds? Um, well, I, I don't... Here's the thing with me. Like, I tend to 
not judge, if you will. Like, I'm the type of person that I always go an hour or two hours before I go play because I want to go here, you know, what these other DJs is playing, are playing, you know, and also as respect. But, you know, like, honestly, I, I, could, I could tell you, like, Toronto, for me, has always been really good. And, and, and the thing, too, I have to say, you know, just, just as, a, you know, as a little advice to you and, and any other DJ, um, trust your gut. Like, you know, majority of people who go into this, this thing want, you know, want a big, big uh, fan club or whatever they want from this. But the one thing that I've learned is that you can always just uh, play how you want to play and play the way that, you know, comes from your heart. And you won't lose, man, because I think that's what people are looking for anyway. Mm. You know, if you, anybody can get up there and play all the hits, you know, after a while. We can kind of, if you've been to the club, and like I said, if you go an hour before, you can kind of get a sense of what you need to do, you know. And you can play what they want, but the thing is, uh, you know, as if you're a great DJ, you give them a little bit of what they want and a lot of what they need, you know. Yeah. That's that's your job, you know, to to you know to push them, you know, push them in places, you know not be afraid to lose that floor, you know, because we know how to get them back. We know what to play. Okay, but play your new record or play that thing you heard the other day that made you feel away, you know, because what they're going to do, walk out the floor and get a cigarette? Oh, <laughs> well, you know what to do to get them back then. Yeah. But take them chances, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel <laughs> so that, that's yeah. where I'm at. I, I, you know, I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. but, like, I, I pretty much don't, never know how – any place is because I go into the room with a blank slate. Mm. And, you know, as I'm listening and I'm looking around the room, I'm getting what I need from people, yeah. you know? Yeah. And as I start, you know, I, you know, I can see who I'm turned off and who I've turned on. And then I'm just going to work my way through. As long as I got five or 10 people dancing, I'm good. Yeah. I know how to work it from there. Yeah. Just, just give me a couple people, yeah. you know, and I got you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'll work it out. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you, bro. Um, I want to ask you: ha Have you heard from DJ Spen with regards to his last trip to South Africa? So he was here, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you? Uh, I mean, he briefly talked about. It. He said it was, you know, it was good. Like, uh, to be honest, we've never had a bad gig, and I've never had a bad gig in South Africa. So. Yeah. I knew it was what it was going to be. It's it's us or it's him over there. Yeah. No brainer. That's a no brainer, dude. That's like Louis over there. Yeah. No brainer. Yeah. That's like Martin over there. No brainer, yeah. man. Yeah. So I, I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. I yeah. knew it. Like he didn't even have to tell me how it was going to go. I know how y'all are. <laughs> and I know how he is. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I'm good. For sure, bro. For sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to ask you just lastly about your your future projects. I, I read somewhere, and I know you're crazy in studio. Um, two things that I I heard. It was an interview back in the days that you did, and you were like, you wanna create so much. If if, if you think of something, you just wanna make it because you. So if you don't do it, somebody else might. So that gave me a sense mm -hmm. that this guy really works a lot in studio. And uh, I read something from. Um, the, the label um, a label that you usually release a lot of stuff on um, R2 records and they were mm -hmm. saying that this guy submitted 43 tracks for an album you know like they can't stop you from making songs so I, I have to ask you what are you working on I, I bought um, earlier in the year the, re the release that you did with um, Nicholas uh, Grant uh, Nicholas Ryan Grant mm -hmm. right with uh, Chipsy mm -hmm. Woman um, but mm -hmm. what else are you working on um, uh, what are we what can oh, we look forward to I got uh, well, Nicholas is, um, is is somebody that I'm really, really proud of, and you know, I've taken him on because I, I, I'm the new A and R at R2. Mm -hmm. So we got a couple more projects with him: uh, Sweet Love Remix, and then we're gonna put out his album, 
you know, well, well, like a mini EP with like some newer stuff and some old stuff that he put out that just never got the light that it should have. And now that the Gypsy Woman has come out and we got these other things, I, you know, I, I'm really focusing on him as an artist. Yeah. So more stuff from Nicholas, um, more stuff with uh, my partner, Tall Black Eye, Terrell. Yeah. Um, my album, if I can finish it, and uh, some some more remixes. I just finished something for um, Raphael Moyes. He uh, asked me for a remix, and there's a song with capital A on the rhymes, but I just did a, a dope dub. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a group out of uh, London called Two Fox. I just did a remix for them. And you know anything else that comes my way, you know I'm, you know you you'll see it on yeah, Instagram. Yeah. That's what my, that's how I use my Instagram. Yeah. If you want to know what I'm up to, there you go. For sure, for sure, bro. Mm -hmm. and, and let me mention Bandcamp as well because you know that's where I, I'm focusing a lot of you know any of my fans. You know that's where I put out all my newer stuff. You know if it ain't through R2, it's going to be on Bandcamp. Yeah. Bank can be so powerful, mm -hmm. man. Like I, I love it. Just, is man. Man, mm -hmm. I think more artists should really be on on mm -hmm. Bandcamp because um, the kind of thing that you could set up your own prices and mm -hmm. you could have a database of your 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 That's clients. It. You know, people who buy the music. So whereas mm -hmm. on a, on another store, people buy it, but you don't really have the connection. You can send people messages. You could do so much, mm -hmm. and I think. Also, most importantly, the, the percentage that Bandcamp takes, you know, is much, much less from what you would take mm -hmm. uh, an, an aggregator takes when you're selling through other major stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, bro. Yeah. I, I, yeah, sorry, you were saying? No, I was going, and, you know, like, I, that's how I met uh, Seven Davis Jr. Uh, and a couple other artists, man, I've met through Bandcamp. Oh, yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's good for that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and if you just want to reach out to you know, get a favorite artist, and you know myself, I, I love it when people are able to reach out to me and you know say, "Oh yeah, you love that," you know, or you know, mm. that's that's whack. Anything you got for me, you know, I'm glad that you know because I'm real. Like I don't want to be one of those those producers that you know, you know, everything is supposed to be good, and I'm wondering why everybody giving me side face of that track I made. <laughs> No, let let me know when I'm whack, man. My my exterior is not, you know, can take a hit. I've been in this music for thirty some years now, so yeah, I can take I can take some hits. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to ask you this one last question. What are okay. you mostly okay. mostly proud of um, about your career? Uh, the people I met. And yeah, the, the the friends and family I have now, mm. that's it. Yeah. Cause that's what a, when the music's gone, what you got? Mm. You know, I got family and friends in so many places. So if you know something should go down, and you know we are in some really tough times right now, I know, you know, as some places I could go. Yeah. For some water, or, <laughs> or a couch, or a night. You know what I mean? Yeah. To get my head together. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, that's what it, you know, for me, that's always what was more important than the money or, you know, the gigs or anything or, you know, what you could do for me. The fact that I got a friend somewhere, you know, I could talk to if something should go down, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or just, just on some family, this is how it should be mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, that's it, man. More than anything, I'm proud of that. The fact that I, I have families and friends in this thing that people say in, in the business, you don't have that or you can't have that. Mm -hmm. And I'm an Aries, so I'm one of them people that, you know, if you tell me I can't, I'm going to show you I can. Yeah. Or it exists. Yeah. 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 Bro, mm -hmm. um, that's so profound. And, and I, I want to say thank you so much because thank you firstly for your time. And for me to be sitting like this, you know, talking to you, bro, like, I'm one of the people that started doing this, you know, from inspirations from people like you, people like Martin, mm -hmm. Shunlade, you know, and, and many more, Kerry Chandler, Vega, many more legends who are still doing it. And, and that's such a 
another dope thing that we don't state enough it's it's not easy to stay so long in this industry you know many people have left man like especially because no, yeah yeah it is dude it's fucking hard because like i said like you know if you really really love it you know like i said i you know i've have you know i've been depressed about it and, and you know that's not good for an artist not you know mm-hmm. and to come out of it you know what you were saying about the, the 40 tracks, that's what helped me come back to music, making that album. So I I couldn't split up those tracks, you know, because if it wasn't for that sessions, you know, those sessions and that period of time, I'd still be, you know, sitting somewhere, you know, wondering why the world doesn't love me. And, you know, forget the world, you know. Yeah. There are other people that like what you do. So for those 10 people, still do it. You know, yeah, so bro. that's it, man. So powerful, man. And I'm glad that you got out of that, you know, because it means that we're going to mm-hmm. be getting more hits oh, from you. I was, I was going to, man. Like, I like it too much. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, you know, if, if there's a drug, that, that's it for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, 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 I fiend for music, man. Yeah. yeah. So that's it, you know. That's it for me. I'm doing it to death, you know, until yeah. I die. Yeah. I'm in it. Mm-hmm. Man, and, and thank you so much because, I mean, you doing that with your own life, you know, also inspires other people. Like I said, people like me, and I'm, I hope that I will do it long enough to inspire other people too, you know, so that the music can keep mm-hmm. on going. It doesn't also necessarily have to be house music or any kind of music. Just the fact that mm-hmm. you, you pursued something that you have passion for, that you love, and it became something that also you give you know, um, mm-hmm. to other people, such a dope thing. Mm-hmm. So, bro, thank you, but, thank but, you so but, much. Uh, okay, but let me say to you, yes, man, you are inspiring. Like, you might not see it, or people might not tell you, because you know, people like to hate and stuff. But trust and believe, you know, you are inspiring, and you know, you probably won't hear it, you know, as much as you would like to. But I, I'll tell you, if you never heard it, you're inspiring, dude. Thank you, bro. So Thank keep you. doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And and to everyone mm-hmm. who's watching, thank you for watching this. Uh, please tag somebody in the comment section who might learn from the video. Please share the video too, you know, so more people can see it, so this platform can grow as well, and we can share the story of house music a bit more to more people. Otherwise, let's remember to stay creative. Peace. Mm-hmm.